We can get the link. Welcome to Wine and Wisdom for this week, Parshat Toldot. This week we read the Parsha of Toldot, and this evening's class is titled To Plow, To Sow, Is To Reap. And it's two sides of the Teshuva coin is what we're going to be discussing today. I'm going to grab my wine. I'm I was sorry. just going to say, before we dive into today's lesson, I would like to encourage everybody. This is Wine and Wisdom. After all, welcome, Amira. Good to see you. I would like to encourage everybody to open up your bottle of wine, pour yourself a glass. If you're having whiskey, if you're having tea, that's also fine. I'm um, having tea, <laughs> All right. If you are having wine, please join us in making a bracha, baruch, ata, adonai, Elohim, Uh, we always start our class by giving a little bit of a Parsha overview. I know most of the people on this group are already familiar with this week's Torah portion. But just to give you a little bit of an overview, overview this week's Parsha is called Toldot, which means generations. And it's because we, we see the progression from the generation of Yitzchak into the generation of Yaakov. Namely, Rivka, after many, many years of being barren, Rivka has twins. She gives birth to twins. Um, Yaakov and Esav, who are opposites in every way. Um, Yaakov is a, a calm and learned man. Esav is a hunter, a man in the field. Um, in any event, the Torah doesn't tell us that much about their childhood, but as they grow up, there's a, a singular episode which occurs, which is that one day Esav comes home from the field. We are told that it's the day that Avraham passed away at 175 years old. Esav comes home from the field, and he is hungry, and he is tired. And Yaakov is in the middle of cooking a customary dish, um, which has round lentils inside of it, and round to symbolize the cycle of life. Um, because Yitzhak had just, um, I'm sorry, Avram had just passed away. And Esau says, can I have some of that, pour some of that into my mouth? And Yaakov says, I will do so if you sell me the firstborn right, the birthright. And Esau says, sure, what, what the heck do I need this stuff for? So he sells it to him, he eats, he drinks, he gets up, he goes, and that's it. Later on in life, however, you know, the Torah tells us a little bit how uh, Jacob and uh, how Esau, how Esau gets married, not Yaakov yet, that's in the next expansion. And then, about how Yitzchak is getting old and well on in years, and he's a little bit blind in his older years, or maybe, maybe perhaps entirely blind, and he decides he wants to bless his children. And he calls him Esau because he thinks he's, he still has the firstborn right, and he says, I'm going to give you a blessing first. Why don't you go out and slaughter an animal for me, bring it back, serve me a meal, and then I will bless you. In the meantime, Rivka, who had overheard this whole business, and Rivka had loved Yaakov more than, more than Esau, she tells Yaakov, I think you should go and get the blessings. She gives him Esau's fur, furry coat or hairy coat, and she says, uh, go. And Yaakov goes, and there's a famous uh, little episode where Yitzchak feels him, because he's not, because he hears Yaakov speaking in a much more refined tone of voice than Yitzchak was known for. And he fam- there's a famous verse where he says, Hakol, call Yaakov, the voice is the voice of Yaakov. Vahayadayim yaday Esav, and the hands are the hands of Esav. Anyways, that is the end of that. Uh, so so uh, Yitzchak uh, subsequently blesses Yaakov, thinking that he's Esav. Um, he gives him the bulk of the blessings, and then Yaakov leaves, and Esav comes to get his share of the blessings, and, Esav, and, and, Yaakov, and Yitzchak says, I can't, I can't, I can give you a small blessing, but most of the blessings were already taken by Yaakov. Um, Esav is furious, he wants to kill uh, Yaakov. Rivka tells Yaakov, run, my son, run, run to Haran, to a place where I have a, a brother whose name is um, Laven, and you'll go live with him. And if anybody says that the Torah wasn't written as a good movie, this is a serious cliffhanger. You know, uh, Esau wants to murder Yaakov, and Yaakov runs away and cut scene, you know, end of the parasha. <laughs> you have to wait for next week's episode to find out what happens. <laughs> Some of you are not going to be able to sleep tonight. All right. So, 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 so this week we're going to talk about the idea that sometimes there is to give and to give again. And what we mean, I mean, we're going to learn this lesson from, uh, from, from Yaakov and the blessings and, and the lesson that he receives from Yitzchak. Um, and therefore, the first thing we need to do is set the scene with uh, Yitzchak about to bless Yaakov and, 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 and the whole exchange between them. Uh, Marilyn, you want to get us started? You're, you're muted, sorry. And Isak said to Yaakov, please come closer though, so that I might feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob drew near to Isak, um, his father, and he felt him and he said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. 
and he did not recognize him because of his hands, because his hands were hairy like the hands of his brother Esau, and he blessed him. And he said, are you indeed my son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, serve it to me that I may eat of the game of my son so that my soul will bless you. And he served him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And his father, Isaac, said to him, please come closer and kiss me, my son. And he came closer and he kissed him and he smelled the fragrance of his garments and he blessed him and he said, behold, the fragrance of my son is like the fragrance of a field that God has blessed. Okay. And a feel and feeling this, you know, tremendously inspired, sorry, feeling thus tremendously inspired by the spiritual fragrance, which he smells on Yaakov or which he senses on Yaakov. Yitzhak launches into the highly sought after blessing, which goes as follows. Uh, Marilyn text one B. Again. Okay. And may God give you the dew of the heavens and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and wine. Nations shall serve you and kingdom shall bow down to you. You shall be a master over your brothers and your mother's son shall bow down to you. Those who curse you shall be cursed and those who bless you shall be blessed. Thank you, Marilyn. The, the blessing goes on, by the way, for a while. And there's lots of different verses, but this is the, the, the big part. And these are the opening words. In case you're thinking, how can any sentence start with and... <laughs> Maybe it was before uh, grammatical rules were invented, right? But, but uh, even so, even if grammatical rules hadn't been invented yet, one of the ones that's kind of very straightforward is that you don't start a sentence with and unless it's continuing from something, right? That's just how sentences work. In other words, the, the word and is kind of a connecting word, right? So the fact that Yaakov starts over these words, and may God give you, seems to imply that there's something beforehand. Yet... This is the opening words. These are the opening words of, uh, of the blessing. And so, of course, if something is glaringly wrong in the simple understanding of the verse, who's going to help us? Anybody? Simple, simple meaning. Rashi. Rashi. Thank you, God. Yes, Rashi. Rashi. If we're looking for the simple, simple understanding, we're going to turn to Rashi. And indeed, Rashi says, um, Marguerite. And my God give you, may he give and give again. Very good. Rashi quotes the words, and may God give you. And Rashi says, you're right. This is a strange wording. And it's to imply that this is not the first giving. Uh, 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 Yitzchak is blessing Yaakov with the standard level of blessing giving that God should give. And then with, and give again. And he should give again. Right? Mm -hmm. here's, 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 here's the real question. Okay? Um, you know, when human beings give, there is occasionally giving and giving again. Right? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm on my way walking to shul, and I'm thinking to myself, um, if I get an aliyah, then uh, I'm going to pledge $180 for my aliyah to the shul. Right? I come to shul, and I'm, I'm listening to the sermon, and during the sermon, the rabbi gives a fiery sermon by giving tzedakah, and how a person should go out of their boundaries, and Hashem will repay him. So I decide, you know what, I'm going to give an extra 180. So comes the aliyah, I pledge 180, and then I pledge another 180. Why? Because something changed in me. Originally, I wasn't as inspired, and now I'm more inspired. Right? I decide to give uh, Arnold a gift. I get him a gift for Hanukkah. I come to his house. I bring the gift, and before I give him his gift, he gives me another gift. And I think I said, wow, I'm so thankful, I'm so, or whatever. I don't, he really says something that really makes me feel my friendship for him. So I, I think to myself, I'm going to give him a gift. And then three days later, I give him another gift. Maybe something happened in between. Maybe I was sick and he, he brought over a good ch warm chicken soup. So I think I should really give him another gift. This is a very human condition. Why? Because we, as human beings, are limited and we're constantly changing. Right? That's what we are. We have different experiences. And those experiences may cause us to, to give and give again and possibly give again. Or, or, or retract our giving, this sort of thing, right? When you talk why about give God, to Arnold, has already stopped. What was that? Say, why give to Arnold? His house is already stopped. I don't know. Anyways, my point is that um, when it comes to God, you would think that God being the giver 
since God is above change, one of the one of the fundamental rules that Maimonides places puts down very strongly about God is he says God is is above change. Right? One of the things we believe about God is not only that there's one God, but also that, that he has never changed. Not before he, the way he was before he created the world, the way he was after he created the world doesn't change because he's omnipotent and omniscient and, and, and before and after it's all the same. Right? So then how can God give a blessing and then give again? If he wants to give again, he would have just given it as part of the original giving. It's not like, oh, he realized something that, that there wasn't before him. Does that make sense? Let's read this question in the Rebbe's words. Kalman, you want to read for us? What was lacking in the first gift that warranted an additional gift to give again, if it were talking about a human giver, we could understand even when one gives a very large and abundant gift at the end of the day, it has a limit and as much as the giver is limited. Therefore, it can be supplemented by an additional gift. But in our case, the giver is God. Certainly God's first give is complete and unlimited. God himself is complete and unlimited. If so, what is added by giving again? Okay, and, and, and by the way, don't get me wrong, we're asking this question in a very philosophical way here, but really it can be a, a much simpler question. It seems to be implied by the opening verse and Rashi's explanation that there is a giving and there's a giving again. What are these? What's going on here? It's just two blessings? Like, like why couldn't it just be one blessing? What are these two blessings? Giving and giving again. Thank you, Kalman, for reading that for us. So, uh, before we dive into it, this is going to be the, the, the topic of today's class, but I want to point out that this was not a blessing. I mean, one of the reasons why this interests us is not just because it was a blessing that Yitzchak gave to Yaakov. It, it was a blessing that, that he was giving to Yaakov for his descendants, right? So this is essentially our blessing. For context, uh, every Saturday evening after the ha- ha- Havdalah, we turn to each other. In other words, and, and, and this is one of the things that it's a custom not, not to say this blessing alone. You say it together, with, not to... If you're alone and you don't know anyone else, then you still say it alone. But ideally, it should be said together with somebody else, like that you're kind of giving, the, you're blessing each other. Okay? And part of the words with which we bless ourselves, or each other, is with the words that we are blessed in the Torah. So this is one of the blessings we give ourselves. Another one is the blessing that Joseph gives to his children. Whatever. But this, these are part of the words that we continue to keep this blessing alive almost like that uh, five-day and counting Fabrengen, we're, we're keeping that blessing alive from generation to generation as we keep going. So and don't forget the priestly blessing that Aaron gave us. Yes, but we, we actually don't say that as part of the uh, as part of the, the Saturday night service. I don't know why. That's a very good question. Really? Yeah. Because it's it's in Sorry. my my book. We do bless each other with that, but we do so... Um, on holidays and other things, but not, not on Saturday night, I don't think. It's in my book. It's in my Saturday Shabbat manual. Really? So it could be the <laughs> different people that have a custom to... Oh, no, 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 no. You're probably talking about on Friday afternoon. No, I'm talking about Friday Saturday night. night. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Possibly there are different nusas. Maybe there are different uh, versions of this. In any event, so that's going to be the topic of today. We're going to try to figure out what is giving and what is giving again, and what are these two different layers of blessings that we have from God, and as a result, what are the two different ways that we should reflect those blessings by receiving them from God. So, like every good point that we're going to make, we're going to start with a story. (laughs) Um, Well, not really a story. We'll start off by going back in history to a man whose name was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Um, Anybody familiar with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? Anybody remember who he was? Anybody here? Come on. What's his name? Some of you that come to the Sunday morning class, the TV Lynch class, we spoke about him at length. Maybe uh, when I start the talking. name is familiar and I forget. Name is familiar. Maybe, the, maybe when I start saying this, did he, find a, he founded a school? No, is that the one who wrote the Zohar? No. Uh, but that no that's by Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, almost a contemporary of his, but not, not quite. Um, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the reason he's, he's most famous is because he lived through the destruction of the Second Temple, that whole era of the destruction of the Second Temple. But many people lived through that era. He is credited with keeping Judaism alive through oh, okay. that tumultuous era and then setting down parameters and ways that we can thrive even in exile. Oh. Is he the rabbi who went, who spoke to the Roman? Absolutely, yes. When he went to Yavna? Yes, he is. To establish his uh, school. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good. Anybody familiar with that now, right? Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai pretended to be dead. His brother-in-law was the the leader of the zealots in the time of the Second Temple uh, uh, siege. 
and uh, they, they, they came up with a scheme together that they're going to sneak him out of, out of the city because he pretended to be dead. Um, we're going to learn now tonight about his five, his five students, his five Talmidim. They actually carried the ark to make sure nobody can, can sense that it wasn't dead weight. Anyways, they snuck him out and, they, uh, and, and he came to, to Vespasian, who was not the Caesar yet, uh, but who became the Caesar as Rabbi Yochanan was speaking to him. There's a whole interesting saga there. We'll leave that as is. Um, uh, and, and Vespasian, because of the impression of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakeh made on him, asked him, what would you like? Kalman, is this familiar at all? Yeah, it's in Gemara and Gittin. Yes, it's in Gemara and Gittin. Thank you. Good. I'm looking for some people. Ron, are you, are you familiar with this at all? Ron? Nope. No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, the, 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 the now Emperor Vespasian turns to Rabbi Yochanan and Zakeh and asks him, what would you like? And it shall be yours, without getting into the whole story how he made a good impression on him. And he asks for three things. One of them is that a, a very famous rabbi at that time should be healed, which we could talk about a different time, why he needed to be healed and how they healed him, etc. The other two things he asks he asks him for are, are extremely, extremely valuable and extremely important. He asks him, first of all, Tenli Yavna which means give me the city of Yavna and the, the sages. And for many years after the destruction of the temple, the Romans allowed the Jews to have a Sanhedrin or a Jewish, uh, 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 Jewish supreme court, kind of, with 71 judges to kind of lead the Jewish people through everything. One of the roles that the Sanhedrin took throughout that era was to figure out, oh, we don't have a temple, so what do we do now to replace this service, to replace that service? You have to remember, Judaism during the, during the times of the Beit HaMikdash was very, very different. We're getting a little off topic here. But the other thing Rabbi Yochanan Zaki asks for is for a particular line of scholars, the house of Rabbi Gamliel, to be kept alive. Anyways, these two things really kept the, Jew, the, the Jews in place and, and with strong leadership and therefore kept Judaism alive. Judaism was able to weather that storm. Obviously, we're not talking from a, from a divine perspective here. There was no question that from a, from a godly perspective, Judaism was never going to falter. But at least from a human perspective, that's how it happened. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan additionally, is also known for probably the most legislation in the Talmud, or not of the most legislation, but a lot of the legislation in the Talmud comes from him. Uh, most of his legislation starts with the same phrase, which is Mishacharav Beit Hamikdash um, Tikin Rabbi Yochanan Medzakai. Whatever topic it is, Rabbi Yochanan Medzakai uh, legislated that since the time that the temple was destroyed, from now on we should do X, Y, and Z. So one example of this is something that I just recently encountered in the Gemara. I'm learning with a, a friend, uh, the tract in a sukkah. And when it comes to the mitzvah of Lulav, back in the day, you would only do the mitzvah all seven days if you were in the Holy Temple. But in the, in the rest of the world, they only shook the Lulav one day of Sukkot. And Rabbi Yochanan Metzak, I realized we're going to forget the whole mitzvah of Lulav if we do that. So he, he decreed that everybody should do it every day outside of Israel as well. Or outside of the Mesa Mikdash as well. And he, many such, such things that he, that he kind of legislated. Yeah, go ahead, Arnold. That, and that's why we do it today. Absolutely, that's why we do it today. Zushi, but I cannot see text. I only see a white big square and ah, the Torah. I was, thank you very much, Marguerite, for keeping us focused. Because I was setting up this text for who Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai was and who his five students were. Um, uh, what are we holding here? Let's do Arnold. Go for it. Text 4a. So this is from Pirkei yeah. Avot, actually. We, we Rabbi studied Yoh Yohanan ben Nasakai had five disciples. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokanus. Uh, uh, Hokenut or Hokenus, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananai, Rabbi Yose Hakohen, yes, thank you, Rabbi Shimon ben Netanel, and Rabbi Elazar ben Arach. He would write, recount their praises. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokenut is a Competent uh, cis, uh, cistern is a, a c cemented cistern that doesn't lose a drop. What does that mean? We're uh, going to talk about that in just a second. Okay, Rabbi Yeh uh, Yehoshua ben uh, Hanania, a fortunate is uh, is she who gave birth to him. Rabbi Yo Yose uh, Hakohen, uh, a Hasid, a uh, pious one. Uh, Rabbi uh, Shimon ben uh, Nathanel. Fears sin. Rabbi Elazar ben Arach is an ever, over ever increasing wellspring. Thank you. So Rabbi Yochanan Mazaka gives praise, his choice words, very specific, positive choice words for each of his students and what's so amazing about them. I don't want to get into all of them. I'll tell you one for fun. Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya, uh, it, it says, fortunate is she who gave birth to him because his mother used to bring him to the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, so, I'm sorry, to the Beit HaMedrash, to the uh, study hall. <laughs> 
when he was a young, young child, and I, I believe even when she was only pregnant with him, um, in order for him to just hear, kind of, yeah. you know, peripherally, the words yeah. of Torah, and that's kind of why he ended up going in that direction. He, she, so she's credited with all of his Torah study, is credited to her. Anyways, what I would like to focus on is Rabbi Elazar ben Arach and Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus, okay? And here's where I have a question for you guys. So one of them is called a cemented cistern, okay? So think of a cistern, like a bucket or a, a sink of some sort that's plastered, so it's completely waterproof, no drain, no nothing. Um, and you fill it up with water, every drop of water that has in it, it retains. None of it disappears. None of it, right? None of it seeps through it and maybe goes down to the bottom, like in a wood, uh, whatever, you know, in a wood vessel of some sort. So this is a, a metaphor for his method of, of Torah study. He would hear teachings from Rabbi Yochan and Zakkai, and he would internalize them, and they would, he would literally would, would never lose a single thing that the Rabbi Yochan Zakkai taught him, and this is, this is considered amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, Rabbi Elazar ben Arach is considered an ever-increasing wellspring. Okay? So my question for the class here, and I would love to hear from some of you, I'm going to pick on those that are quiet, that's what I'm going to do. Um, London, what do you think? Of these two people, which do you think is more valuable? Which is a more coveted uh, uh, value to have? I don't know. This is the first time I'm hearing all of this. <laughs> That's okay. But let me ask you. If you hear about somebody, oh, he, he never forgets anything he's taught, or somebody else is like an ever-increasing spring, which one would you think is a better? Probably the ever-increasing spring. Okay. You want, you want to elaborate, or it's just, it seems that way to you? Well, I don't know how relative my thought process is, but okay. from, from what I understand, you know, what we don't accomplish in this lifetime, what we don't comprehend or learn our lesson from, then we'll just repeat it in the future. So if you're able to advance yourself in this lifetime, then every lifetime after this will be, you know, even greater. Oh, so you're saying ever increasing, mean, you're taking it to mean advancing. He's advancing. Yeah, is right. that right? Okay. Yeah, well, it's definitely right. It's a perspective. Marilyn, what do you think? I, I think I, I would guess the same, uh, Rabbi Lazar Ben Arak, um, because when I think of a spring, I, keep, I think of life and movement and creativity rather than... Uh, holding things in and absorbing them you don't you don't know what the person it's just more creative okay like it for ideas that are being spewed out absolutely arnold what do you say um uh, frankly i think that um uh if you're able to hold in what you've learned and maintain it then you become the foundation forever uh forever increasing uh uh springs as it were but if it's only a spring the spring can go in all different directions and it may change and it may change its course it may not be the same as when it be- first began okay. so having the foundation that is um uh, a solid foundation that doesn't change and holds in the, the primary ideas that i think Absolutely. is the most important i love it text 4b um the mishnah explains how, how Rabbi Yochanan used to praise um, which one was the greatest, okay? Um, we'll be holding here. Let's do Alex. Alex, you want to read for us a little bit? You're, you're muted, Alex. I'm there getting there. Hang on. Give me one. All right. No worries. <laughs> Can you see the screen? I do. Hang on. We come back. No I see worries. Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> well, Arnold is a handsome man. It's always worth it to see Arnold. Oh, now you're muted. Oh, 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 oh. You're going a little too far, Rabbi. <laughs> Rabbi Yochanan would say, if all the sages of Israel were to be in one cup of a of, of balanced scale, and Eliezer ben Harkonus were in the other, he would outweigh them all. Abba Shaul said his name. If all the sages of Israel were to be in one cup of, of a balanced scale, Eliezer ben Harkoros included and El- Eliezer ben Arach were in the other, the latter would outweigh them all. Okay. And they so they're awfully big guys then. They're awfully big guys, then, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, they were awfully big in their minds. So yeah. it turns out that Eliezer was like a cemented sister and never lost a single detail from his teacher. 
was the greatest of all sages. But if even he was together with all the other sages on one side, Rabbi Lazar ben Arach would be, would be greater than them. Why? Because he was like a wellspring who turned out more promising as his learning was ever increasing. Okay? So what's going on here? Someone who's a Smith sister and indeed receives and maintains and maintains and maintains and can probably be, like Arnold said, a foundation. So in a way, you guys both write. But I guess those that said of Lazar ben Arach is greater are even more right. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, an ever-increasing uh, ever spring basically says, I, I take in everything I have, and then I add to it, right? So a spring has water in it. It's got, it gets water from somewhere, and then it, it, it increases on that. And it keeps pushing out more water and more water. It's kind of more unlimited. And, just and also it's giving to the, pe to the people around. It's, it, it's, 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 also, yeah, it's also contributing. It's, it's also contributing. It's not only taking, it's also giving. Yeah, it's giving. It's giving water. It waters the people that are around it. Mm -hmm. So the Rebbe points out that actually when God gives us a blessing, it also works in the same way. There's also these two fashions of giving. Um, Ron, you want to read for us, please? The difference between the cemented cistern and the ever-increasing wellspring as applied to, to Yaakov's blessing, Yaakov didn't just received goodness from above, he also received the ability to stand on his own two feet. In other words, to develop that goodness in a personal way using his own resources. This is what it means to give and give again. Isaac's blessed, Isaac blessed Yaakov that God give him the goodness from above and also give again the ability to use his goodness and strengthen himself with it on his own. Okay, thank you. So what is, we started off the, 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 this, this evening's class with a question. What does it mean to give and to give again? These are two layers of blessing that God is giving to a human being. Number one is to actually receive all the blessings that I've given you. Be a cemented cistern. Yaakov was to receive the entirety of the blessing. And to give again is that he should be like an ever-increasing spring. That Yaakov be able to develop the blessings on his own without limits. All right. Should we call it a night? Or you guys want to hear a powerful life lesson from this? Well, it doesn't answer the question, though, I don't think. Okay. We I'm need a... more. We need more. We need more. Okay. Kalman, what's your question? Well, the, the question originally by the Rebbe um, was, how can you have an Indian of Yitain V'yachzer V'yitain by a Kodesh Baruch Because what's wrong with the first time he gives? So how did we answer that? So I guess the answer here would be that 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 it's it's too human in other words, God can sometimes give us a blessing that received as a human being. The, the limit, the, certainly the limiting on it is, is on the human end of it. The question is, what are those two, those two different categories of blessings that we can receive from God? One is that God can give us a blessing that only fills, or let's say only itches, or only scratches the, the, the give, the giving itch that we have. In other words, the layer number one, to receive the blessing and to internalize it and just have it. And layer number two, is to also scratch the itch that we have to give again, which is to not just internalize it, but to develop it and be able to put, put to, to, to add to it and, and internalize it and, uh, and have it flesh out throughout our life. Does that make sense? It's very much like the land uh, around us. Uh, it has all the nutrients that, uh, uh, that we need, but mm -hmm. uh, you need seeds to, to uh, be planted and they do, they take out from that land and change it. And they okay. form something that is nutritious. A hundred percent. That's a good, yeah, it's a good uh, uh, herbological way of looking at it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it was like what Marilyn was saying, is that the first time that Hashem gives you a bracha, it's the giving from Hashem to you. And then the, the second V'yitain is that you give to others like the Mayim HaMizgaber. That you are taking, absolutely, that is what it is. First of all, I wouldn't just limit it to giving it to others. It's even, you're receiving more from it because you're internalizing it, you're making it your own. The whole idea of a Mayanam is Gaber is that it also becomes your own and you're able to give, give of it. So it also helps you. But more importantly, I wouldn't limit that to being a human condition. In other words, God has to give us, the, just like God gives us the blessing for everything, God has to give us the blessing for step one and God has to give us the blessing for step two as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I really want to get to the next part of this because this is the, for me the most exciting part, which is it turns out that this whole idea of giving, giving again, is also reflected as it always is in the human condition, right? A human being having, having been created in the image of God, we too have in our lives kind of two different tracks that we can take, the giving track 
and giving again. Mm-hmm. In Hebrew, these two tracks are called the Tzaddik and the Baal Teshuvah. A tzaddik is a holy man. He receives everything that he does, everything that he does, amazing. Every part of Torah mitzvahs, he keeps it, he's retaining it. He's like a, a cemented sister, and there's never a time that he fails. A Baal Teshuva is, uh, is more of a maverick. He's kind of all over the place. He's unorthodox, he's different. He sometimes fails, he sometimes wins. He, 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 he definitely has failed in the past, and then he wins and he overcomes, and he's like this Mayan Amis Gabra or this, or this overwhelming fountain. Um, this idea of a, a, a Baal Teshuva or someone who has done bad in the past and now is doing good and is, is, is building off of this growth <clears throat> is referenced in the Talmud. Um, and in the Talmud, they talk about a very interesting phenomenon. Okay. Um, Amira, can you read for us text six? Yes. Raish Lakish said, Great is repentance for all the transforms one sins into merits, as the verse states, and when a wicked man repents of his wickedness and performs justice and right, sorry, right, (laughs) he shall live because of them. Okay, so thank you, Amira. This is a verse from uh, to, uh, I thought it was Tehillim. Maybe it's not actually. I don't remember where from. Oh, it's from Yechaskel. They have a reference there. There is a verse in Yechaskel in Ezekiel which says as follows: It says, rasha mi v'asa mishpat utztaka aleihem yichya." That when a, when a Russia, a, a, a wicked man, a person who has done bad things in his life, repents from his evil ways and he does justice and righteousness and right, starts going on the great on the good the good and true path, the straight and narrow. Here's the interesting words. Aleyhem Yichya, he will live by them. He will live because of them. So it points out, Rishlach, because you know what these words teach us? That are about Teshuvah. You know what's so great about somebody who did bad in the past and now is overcoming it and growing because of it? What's great about him is that his Zidonot, Nasim Lo his evil acts of the past become like good deeds for today. I'm looking at some of you and you're like, Look, I, I, his, he has negative acts, but to say that they became good acts, where does Reish Lakish get that? Right? So besides for the verse, Reish Lakish gets this from his personal history. Here's a good story for you if you ever wanted one. Uh, London, you want to read for us a little bit? This is the story of Reish Lakish's life, okay? And more importantly, how he met Rabbi Yochanan. Text 7. One day... Rabbi Yochanan was bathing in the Jordan River. Reish Lakish saw him and jumped into the Jordan. Pursuing him, Rabbi Yochanan said, Your strength is fit for Torah study. Reish Lakish replied, Your beauty is fit for women. Rabbi Yochanan said to him, If you return to a life of Torah, I will marry you off to my sister, who is even more beautiful than I am. Hold on one second. So um, Reish Lakish at the time was a bandit. Not just a bandit, but he led the gang. He, it was a tremendous gang of bandits, and he was kind of the leader. Um, and he was extremely strong, so it tells us the Gemara. And he pursued Rabbi Yochanan in order to steal from him while he was bathing in the river. To tie him up, beat him up, I don't know, whatever. And Rabbi Yochanan won him over with words. Now Rabbi Yochanan happened to be strikingly handsome. <laughs> the Talmud tells us this, and the Talmud goes into great length about it, about how, how beautiful of a man he was. So this is the exchange that they had. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan looks at him and goes, your strength is fit for start Torah study. <laughs> and he looks at him and goes, your beauty is fit for women. <laughs> Anyways, so Rabbi Yochanan thinks to himself, this is an opportunity. This man, I, I could change his life. And he does. Go ahead. Funny how compliments change over a few thousand years. Huh? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Reish Lakish accepted upon himself to study Torah. Rabbi Yochanan taught him Tanakh and Mishnah and turned him into a great man. When Reish Lakish died, Rabbi Yochanan was exceedingly pained. The rabbi said, who will go to calm him? They said, let Rabbi Eliezer ben Padat, Padat go, as he's proficient in Torah study. Rabbi Eliezer ben Padat went and sat before him. Every time Rabbi Yochanan would cite a teaching, Rabbi Eliezer, is it Eliezer or Elazar? This was Elazar. Elazar. Ben Padat would say, 
there is a ruling taught in a barita that supports your opinion. And said to him, are you like the son of Lakish? The son of Lakish, when I would cite a teaching before him, instead of supporting my idea, he would raise 24 difficulties attempting to prove me wrong, and I would furnish him with 24 answers supporting my claim. In this fashion, the study was broadened, and yet you tell me that there is a barita substantiating me. Do I not know that I am speaking sense? Rabbi Yochanan went around, went, went around rending his clothes, weeping and, and saying, where are you, son of Lakish? Where are you, son of Lakish? Thank you, London. Here we have a picture painted of a, 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 uh, a tzaddik and a Baal Teshuva. Rabbi Yochanan was a man who would teach Torah and he, he thrived off of Reish Lakish's unorthodox ways, off of his challenging everything, of the fact that he had such chutzpah that nothing was ever right for him. <laughs> you know, in, in, uh, in, um, in today's like Facebook social media world, a lot of people talk about something called groupthink, right? Where people kind of just go along with the flow. One of the reasons that, that, you know, social scientists point out why groupthink occurs is because people tend to surround themselves with like-minded people, right? If you're on Facebook, and somebody is constantly disagreeing with you, there's a good chance you're going to unfriend them, right? <laughs> or if you're attending a class and everybody seems to think differently than you, there's a good chance you're going to feel uncomfortable and not come back, right? So what we do as human beings, because we like to feel comfortable, we, we surround ourselves always with people that agree with us. So when we start to think a certain way, in today's day and age, most notably with politics, when we start to become more and more, let's say, Republican, and we keep surrounding ourselves with more and more Republicans, of course, we're never going to think and understand the, 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 de the Democrat perspective or vice versa, right? Because we're constantly surrounding ourselves with people that are like-minded to us. You could say the same thing about Orthodox Jews uh, versus Reformed Jews, for instance, right? Or the same thing about Israelis versus Americans, this kind of thing, right? Which is why it's so important to surround ourselves with people that are different than us and have a variety in our lives, which is why I love my job as a Chabad rabbi, because I get to surround myself with all different sorts of people on the Zoom alone. Um, rabbi Yochanan was pointing out, after Rish Lakish passed away, he says, Rabbi Elizabeth Badat, you're not helping me. He says, I don't need your proof. I said my statement because I believe that it is correct. Does it not make sense to me? Of course it makes sense to me. I don't need you to bring me proof from more and more places. If I needed people to just reconfirm everything I'm saying, right? Confirmation bias doesn't help me, <laughs> right? So, um, and, and, and what he enjoyed most about Rish Lakish was his lack of acceptance. This was the big mistake that Rabbi Lazar and Pedat made. Rabbi Lazar and Pedat was a classic tzaddik. Everything the Torah says is true. Everything the Torah says I accept. I will do it. And don't get me wrong, that's an amazing, amazing quality to have. Because as human beings, it's difficult for us to do that. And because you're connected to God at a very divine level, do you really manage to retain everything? And that is the level of Rabbi Eliezer and Horkonos of, of Bayer Sitch in Abed Tipa, is a, a, a cemented sister that never loses a drop. But Rish Lakish would come to Rabbi Yochanan and he would challenge and he would challenge and he would challenge. And this came because of his background, because of who he was. He came from a place where you didn't just accept what, 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 what there was. He was an outlaw, he was a bandit, he was a gang leader. He was the one who said, oh, these people think that you're not supposed to go here and you're not supposed to do this. I'm going to do it anyways. Because I, rules are not for me. Rules are for other people. So when he came to study in Torah, he did the same thing. He said, oh, we're supposed to just accept what Rabbi Yochanan says because he's such a great rabbi. Because he's confirmed by this writer and that Mishnah and this section of Talmud, I'm going to challenge and challenge and challenge him. A classic Baal Teshuvah, if there ever was one. A classic returning to Judaism, somebody who has a negative past, which is fueling him forward. He has, he has a, a different perspective, something different which he brings to the table, which he refuses to let go of. When a, when, a, when, a, when a maverick, when somebody like that, somebody with unorthodox ways, actually, so when a, so you have people that they have unorthodox ways, and then their unorthodox ways means that they are bandits and they're gang members. And that's it that they do their whole life. What they do is they murder, they steal, they rape, and they plunder. <laughs> that person is certainly not being called <laughs> a righteous man. But if you can take that tendency that personality trait, that character trait of yours and channel it to holiness. If you can take not even just the character trait, but the past, the negative past that you had and actually use it as a catalyst for growth, that can be extremely powerful. There is a, 
You know, the, uh, the Rebbe didn't write many books, actually, surprisingly. Um, uh, Zushi, what's the word Baraita means? Baraita means, it's, it's, it's one of the, it, it, it's the Mishnah before the Mishnah was redacted. Whatever, it's, it's, it's a proof. It's a statement by, by, by the sages. Now is not the time okay. to talk about the difference between these things. You know, the Rebbe didn't author many books. The Rebbe, for the most part, spoke, and he had Hasidim who would write down his thoughts, and then they would give it to him, and the Rebbe would edit them. And that's most of the Rebbe's wisdom that we have today. The Rebbe did, however, author a few books, a handful of books. One of them is the Hayom Yom. We actually read it at Chabad every single morning after, after the Avenue. And there's a Hayom Yom, which is so powerful. And it talks about the fact that there are seven lessons that you can learn from a thief. Because in Judaism, these ideas are not things, negative things are not supposed to stay negative. We're supposed to figure out how to uplift them and elevate them and use them for holiness. And this is what Reish Lakish did. This is in general, this is the perspective of Baal Teshuvah. He's a true, ever-increasing spring. This is what, where Reish Lakish comes from when he tells us this statement, Zidonot Nasim Lo Kezachiot. His past negative misdeeds become his, his, his righteous deeds. They fuel his growth. And that's why the verse says he lives by them. Um, I think we're back up at the top. Marilyn, you want to read text 8 for us where the rabbi elaborates? No, you're, you're muted. The advantage of the ever-increasing wellspring is a limitlessness which the cemented cistern lacks. Similarly, the advantage of Bale Teshuva is that their spiritual work is not restricted. As we know, Sadakim operate in a very orderly, measured way, advancing one step after another. But the Baal Teshuvah can jump every hurdle, advancing without taking the steps. Thank you. And this is, by the way, this, this should not be a novel concept to us. Maybe it's novel that it's being applied to Judaism, but this shouldn't be a novel concept to us. You know, the, the world talks about this all the time. Everybody knows Steve Jobs wasn't a normal, regular person, right? He was a rule breaker. That's what he was. That's what he was. He lives. Well, now he's not alive. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in his youth, he walked around, didn't shower for weeks. You know what I mean? Like walked around barefoot, like hippie kind of style, whatever. Oh, rules. That's not for me. People say you're supposed to shower once a day. It's not for me. And for the most part, most people were grossed out by him and disgusted by him. And, and, and the fact that he didn't listen to rules and he didn't have social norms, etc. But he, he used that to channel that to build a, a multi-billion dollar company. <laughs> I have a... Uh, a chavrusa that I learn with on a weekly basis, and he's currently, uh, uh, um, he, he was cast as a role in the latest Apple TV series, whatever the next one is. And, and today, I was actually studying with him today, and in the middle, in the middle he gets a phone call, and, and, and I forgot what it was, like, like, he was supposed to have an appointment for something at three o'clock, instead of it was at one o'clock, and he, he got all worried. And he tells me, but don't worry, he says, they could do whatever they want with me. And they know that. They can move it on my schedule. He says, why? Because they, uh, they, they, they're paying me so much for this role, much higher than other roles that I get paid for. He says, Apple is known to be rolling in dough. Apparently, this particular show, they won the bid for this show off of Netflix and Hulu and, and, uh, and ABC and not ABC, uh, HBO. Right? Well, because they're, they're a huge play. I mean, it shouldn't come as news to anybody, right? Apple, Apple, Apple is a multi-billion dollar company, right? And it's a, and it's, it's, it's a big success. And for the most part, it's credited to a man named Steve Jobs, not just the founder, but also later on for spearheading it and, 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 and taking that ship forward. And, and, and you, by the way, this is throughout history. You look at the people who broke the rules, those are the people who did the best. Now, what I'd like to point out to you is that these are all what, if they were doing that in Judaism, we would call Baal Teshuva. In other words, there are a lot of people, I have a lot of friends that are breaking rules right now and they're be failing dismally at life. You know what I mean? They don't have a job. They're unemployed, and which is very unorthodox to be unemployed. And, <laughs> and that's why they're not making money. And that's why some of them are living very, very poor lives. Right? Or, uh, I don't know, they decide they're not listening to their boss and then they get fired. <laughs> so I'm not saying that everybody should go and do unorthodox things, but if you can channel that attitude in the right direction, that does lead, 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 lead to the right thing. And that is the idea of the Mayan Amizgada. And this is the idea of giving and giving again. Uh, Kalman, you want to bring it home for us? Text 9. It emerges that the blessing Jacob received that God give and give again included not only spiritual and physical goodness, including both benefits, the full blessing, including a long bracket, 
including both benefits, the full blessing itself, as well as the ability to develop it on its own. Rather, it also includes the ability from above to live by both models of spiritual growth, the tzaddik model represented by God giving, as well as the Baal Tshuva model represented by God giving again. This is yitain v'yasor v'yitain, right? To give and to give again, not just to be a tzaddik, but to be a Baal Tshuva, to be both. And that the Jewish people should at times be able to be at one level or at another level. And this is an amazing, amazing, amazing perspective. Um, we're going to skip this point that they added into the lesson. I felt like it, it I mean, it, it, it's valid, but it, it detracts a little bit. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit to the idea of what it means pre- precisely to be a Baal Teshuvah. Okay, so here we have the Rambam's words, Maimonides' words. Uh, Baron, can you read for us or you're not reading today? Baron? Yes, not. So Ron, you're up. So text 13, I is, can read. Is the Rambam Maimonides um, uh, telling us about the way of Teshuva? Among the paths of a repentance is for the penitent to A, constantly call out before God, crying and entreating. B, perform charity according, according to his potential. C, separate himself far from the object of his sin. D, change his name as if to say, I am a different person and not the same one who sinned. E, change his behavior in its entirety to the good and the path of righteousness. And F, travel in in exile from his home. Exile atones for sin because it causes the person to be submissive, humble, and meek of spirit. Thank you, Ron. Think about how Rish Lakish must have felt the first time he walked into a uh, a, a yeshiva or a study hall. And he's sitting there and, and they're, they're, they're on a level that's way above him. He's used to being the leader among, among bandits, leader among thieves, right? And here he is, the lowest person in the Beit Medrash, really on, in terms of level, he can't understand anything. He's got to start with learning alphabet. I don't know if he knew alphabet or not, right? And, and literally go the whole gamut. It can be depressing. It can be depressing. Why? Because in this moment, when he's decided to turn his life around, all of a sudden, all of his past comes to haunt him. Where was I in fifth grade when I should have been learning uh, m- m- Mishnayot? And where was I in seventh grade when I should have been learning this and learning that and, and advancing in my Yiddishkeit and l- learning in my Ju- growing in my Judaism, etc.? Right? The Rebbe points out that, that, that in the Rambam, the Rambam says that a, a big part of the idea of, of Teshuva is what the, the negative elicits from you. He talks about the way, the way of teshuva, the paths of the, of, of the penitent, right? The way that somebody does teshuva. They have this, this, this attitude of their past fuels them. Let's see it in the Rebbe's word, in, in the Rebbe's words. Alex, uh, sorry, Marguerite, Marguerite wants to read, text 14. Mm-hmm. Okay, for teshuva to produce the desired result, it must be geared in the right direction. Underlying the sorrow and regret one feels must be the purpose. Fulfilling the Torah and the mitzvah henceforth. Therefore, the plowed field refers not only to the feeling of brokenness, but also to the growth Teshuvah produces. In, 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 in teshuva, the moment that we've done something negative, we now have two approaches, right? We spoke about the fact that there are many people out there in the world that are unorthodox. Not every one of them is Steve Jobs. Right? Why is that? Because some people, they, their, their unorthodoxness is still leading them astray. You have to learn to, to say, oh, I am unorthodox. I have tendencies to do these types of things. I, or maybe I've even done things in the past that are negative. You have to learn to say to yourself, that's not negative. That's opportunity for growth. That's fueling for yearning for God. That's, that, that's, that's an opportunity to be, to have sorrow and regret for that, which will fuel a much deeper relationship with the Almighty. Like Rish Lakish did. Right? When a Jew messes up, we shouldn't wring our hands and say, oh my God, oy vey, oy vey, I did something terrible, right? And now I'm the worst person that exists. We should use that to fuel our future growth because the blessing of Yitzchak is not just Yitain, but even in a case where Yitain, sometimes you fall from the Yitain. Sometimes you fall from level stage one of giving, the Yachs or the Yitain, you can come back. And that coming back can be an unlimited type of growth. Alex, 
Do you want to read text 15 for us? The, 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 the Rebbe Rashab had a very unique perspective on, on, on what a person is supposed to do when they've actually done something negative. Go ahead. My father, the Rebbe Rashab, writes in one of his letters, a single act is better than a thousand groans. Our God lives, and Torah and mitzvahs are eternal. Quite the, the groaning Quit, and work, quit the groaning. Quit the groaning and work hard in actual service of God, and God will be gracious to you. Thank you. When I was 14 years old, I heard something which today still rings in my ears. In the evening, sir, I, I might have shared this before at a previous one in wisdom. In the, in the evening service, my riff, which I haven't davened yet, and right after this, I'll daven my riff. Right before Shemona Yisrael, right before the Amidah, we say, we say a prayer. It's called Hashkivenu. It's a paragraph called Hashkivenu. I don't have the text in front of me now. Hold on. Let me open a seder. I'll quote for you exactly. This is such powerful stuff. Hey, by the way, it's a fairly straightforward prayer. Hashkivenu avinu lashal. Make us lie down in peace. You know, we're asking God when we go to sleep. We should go to sleep and we should be re re regenerated. Right? And here's, here's one of the things we ask for. Um, the Hasir Satan, remove Satan, or the evil inclination, milafaneinu meacharenu, from before us and from after us. Okay, that's one of the lines that we throw out. And it, by the way, if you look at it very straightforwardly, you say, all right, we don't want Satan, we don't want the evil inclination anywhere around us, right? But this rabbi, and I don't remember who it was when I was 14 years old, I, I think it might have been Rabbi David Kahana, one of my teachers. And he tells me like this, he says, Sushi, I don't understand. I get that we don't want the evil inclination before us. That's, I get what that means. Before you're standing in front of some sort of temp, temp, temptatious, is that a word? Situation. And you need strength. So you're asking God that when that situation arises, I should have the strength to be able to overcome my evil inclination. That I get. That I get. What's me acharenu? What did you think that the moment that you flunk, the moment that you, that, that you fail, the moment that, you, that, that you, you had a challenge in front of you and you, you botched it up, what did you think Satan would go and rejoice? Right? Wouldn't the Satan, wouldn't the evil inclination just go, hooray, I got him to do it. Why is he hanging around me? Right? What's me'acharenu? What's after us? And he pointed out, he said, Zushi, because the way that the evil inclination works is that he, he's got a constant cycle going on. Step one is I get you to eat something non-kosher. Step two is the next morning you're about to come to Minyan and he says, who do you think you are to go to Minyan? You, you're a Jew who eats non-kosher. Why would you go to Minyan? Right? And then that evening, somebody asks you if you can come and help, I don't know, whatever, right? Come and help them schlep something. And he says, you, you think you're such a tzaddik? You think you're such an amazing person? No, no, no. You, you're a terrible person. Remember? Last night you, did, you, you, did, you, you ate something that wasn't kosher, and this morning you didn't go to Minyan. And, he, and this way he keeps pushing you down the slippery slope. A Jew has to learn that when we were blessed by Yitzchak to Yaakov, and by the blessing of Hashem, right? He's, Yitzchak gave him the blessing from Hashem. That he gave us a blessing not just of Yitim, not just that we should be successful, but that when we are unsuccessful, we should be able to use our negative situations to fuel growth. Right? Some of us are sitting and we're thinking, Oi, do you know how many times I can say Oi in my day? I have space for a thousand groans in the day. Comes the Rabbi Hashem and he tells us, no. One action is worth better than a thousand groans. One action. Just get up, go make one bracha. Go learn one piece of Torah. By the way, I, I, I practice this all the time. You know, life gets you down and you're stressed out and you're like, God, what am I doing with my life, right? Whenever I'm in such a situation, I know it's coming from the, from the evil inclination because I, I, this is not a logical argument. Open up a book of Torah. Start studying some Torah. Go do a mitzvah. Go help somebody. Immediately, it'll, it'll hit you out of the rut. Why? Because one action is worth more than a thousand groans. L'chaim, l'chaim. If there's one lesson that we take from tonight, I think it's very, very clear. Yeah, Hashem gives us the clear. God. Hashem gives us the energy not just to do, but to pick ourselves up when we fall. And not just to pick ourselves up when we fall, but when we fall, God looks at it and he says, this is why I created falling, because I wanted you to fail. And when you fail, you should use that as a catalyst for future growth. You shouldn't look at it and say, ah, I'm down in the mud. I may as well dig myself down deeper. We should use it as, 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 a, as, as yearning, as, as, as a, a power for, 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 for fueling, for, for a regret of the past and moving forward towards the future. We should become the ultimate Baal Teshuvah. We can learn from Rish Lakish's example. If we have failed, if we have done something wrong, that means we are rule breakers. 
And if we are rule breakers, then we can break the rules in Torah. Why do we have to break the rules of Torah? We can break the rules in Torah and use that unique personality that we bring to the table in order to grow in Torah and mitzvahs. L'chaim, l'chaim. I thought you were going in a different direction with that v'haser satan now chareinu. Okay, um, let me hear you. That's fine. Because last, um, I saw something last week, the, the smichus of uh, the Misa of Sarah to the Arkeda was that uh, Avraham should not have regretted doing the Arkeda because it caused Sarah's death. So you're saying that sometimes the Hasa Sotam Yacharenu, in other words, to take away the evil inclination after we do something positive, then right. we should regret having done something positive. Yeah, I can't remember who says some Ayachidish. Somebody says. No, I understand. That. You're it. That's fine. That was the real Nisayan of the Arkeda that even after. Even after he came down from the mountain, and he knows, and he knows that you know he maybe was successful, but that resulted in the Sarah's death. He still did not regret doing that mitzvah. Yeah, some uh, somebody once told me that that um, that's somebody once told me. I, I saw this once written somewhere that Avram 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 had a challenge. It wasn't just a challenge for him to sacrifice his son, and in the moment that God said no, that's not what I meant. He was like, phew. No, that's yeah. not what it was. Apparently, it was so common in those days. This was a common idea. He was like, great. Finally, this God is normal. He asked me to do something like all the other gods asked him to do. And I'm going to be able to sacrifice my son to the gods. That was a common thing in those days, apparently. There were, there were, there were idols that were served in this manner. That you sacrifice your, your children to the, to the idol. So maybe in the beginning, it was a challenge for him to do it. But according to this commentary, it was a challenge also for him not to do it. When he finally yeah. got himself to a position where he was going to do it, it was a challenge for him to listen to God and not do it. He's like, are you kidding me? You got me all the way here, got me all the way worked up, and now I don't do it? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Anyways, no, it's not the same idea you're saying. It's a similar idea. Anyways, yeah. thank you all for joining us. Ron, what do you say? What do you have to say? You're so quiet. You're never quiet, Ron. Thank you, Rabbi. You're, oh, that's what you say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Very good class. Thank you. Baron, thank how are you doing? Stay I'm safe. good, thank God. Thank you, Rabbi, for bringing so much passion and everything. It makes me feel a part of Mishpucha and just getting a blitz of learning Torah. May Hashem bless you. No, Baron, I just want to say that we used to always, I used to always, uh, I used to always say that you, you have a very busy job. And unfortunately, it means that we can't study, you can't come to as many classes as you can. But now I feel like you could be working and learning at the same time. It's great. I love it. Yeah, I'm doing the best I can. Thanks. <laughs> All right. And have we can night, eat in the same time. time. What was that? Yeah. I say, and we can have our own snacks and eat. And exactly, yeah. That makes oh, me yes, like yes. a good yes. gathering. Fun bringing. Margarit, if you keep there talking, you are. Margarit, if you keep talking, <laughs> I'm gonna think. I'm gonna think that you're gonna that you don't like the snacks that I serve. <laughs> no, I love the food you do with them. Okay, but okay. After I take away, I just want to warn you guys. <laughs> I just want to say tonight in my house there were cookies baking, and this is a typical night that if uh, if 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 there was a class going on, Gitty would have said, "Take some home baked cookies for the class." So it's your loss. <laughs> yeah, I, I had cookies and wine. Ah, there you go. You see. <laughs> I'm just yeah. dumb. I am that Alex. One day we will be able to gather again in the shul and have its nice gathering. <laughs> Amen. Listen, our community has a lot of celebrations coming up, so please join us uh, on on Shabbos and shul. In, in two weeks from now, we have one bar mitzvah, and then we have two bar, two bar mitzvahs, each, one week after the other. So we're gathering yes. in different ways these days, but we're still gathering, and you should join us. Please, please, all of you, join us on Shabbat. We have such a nice davening. It's a little bit social distance, but that's fine. We wear masks. It's fine. We're human beings. We've been through much worse before. You know what I mean? We can, be mm -hmm. through, we, we can, we can get through this as well. And uh, it's going to be big celebrations, I promise you. The Kahan family is having a bar mitzvah, and the Akavan family is having a bar mitzvah. Right. It's very nice. Anyways. What was that name oh. of, the, um, of the man you had who used to be a... Um, a bandit? Not like you know, He wasn't really a bandit, but he was a Rabbi Lakish. You had him come and, and speak. I, I missed it, unfortunately. But, oh, 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 he spoke? Um, he wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Jew, but he... he he was uh, one of those skinheads. Oh, yeah. Remember, he went. He what was his name? He was Frank a skinhead. Mink. Yeah, his name was Frank Mink. Frank Mink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
He yeah, could be a Rabbi Lakish. Yeah, he could be. Yeah. He could be. He's somebody that he not only is had right negative now. experiences in the past, but he's using his negative experiences. I remember he was a gang member, and one of the things that he does, he has an organization that does interventions for current gang members. 100%. That's a huge... Yeah. That's that's a symptom of that, 100%. He, he's a red blockish in his community. Yeah, but here's the deal, Marilyn. I don't want you to think about it in that term. You're right. He is. But he, I would call him an extreme race luckish. But what is our race luckish? That's my question. What is the thing that oh, we, I know. That I we know. have? Because we all have things that we did in the past that are that are not the best. Yeah. Some of us more, more than others. Some of us yeah, lower yeah. or smaller, or, you know, bigger things than others. But the idea is we have to use those and understand that those should be positive catalysts for growth. Yes. Rabbi, you shouldn't be talking about me. I am the high end. What was that? You shouldn't be talking about me. I always talk about the most handsome guy in the room. (laughs) Amira, it's good to hear from you. Thank you, Rabbi. The class was amazing. Thank you very much. You got it. it. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. 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 See you guys.